Okay, so let's review for the Unit 4 exam. Um, first of all, we start off with the knowledge that we, you know, that we had from previous units where we had the kinematic equations. You know, V equals V naught plus AT. Uh, delta X or delta Y equals V plus V naught over 2 times time. Delta X equals V naught T plus 1 half AT squared. V squared equals V naught squared plus 2A delta X. These were the kinematic equations. And what was the assumption? What, what had to be true for these to be valid. And it, what has to be true? Yes. Yeah. The, the acceleration during the time interval you're looking at, uh, the acceleration had to be constant. So these all assumed that the acceleration was constant for the given time interval. Thank you. Uh, all right. Now, so this described motion very nicely. We were able to solve all kinds of problems using these equations. But they didn't tell us why things accelerate. And so Newton came along and kind of revealed to us what causes objects to accelerate. And because if I've just got a massive object here, maybe just a, a block that's sitting on the, on the ground, mm -hmm. this thing is not going to move unless you force it to move. But once it's in motion, it's going to stay in motion with constant speed and direction until you force it to stop. So if you want to change the way things are moving, you have to apply a force. That's really Newton's first law. Newton's laws. First, second, and third. First law is all about inertia. And I'm not going to rewrite the whole thing here, but it basically says objects have inertia. They don't want to change what they're doing. If they're in motion, if they're moving, they want to stay moving. Uh, with constant speed and direction. Uh, if, if they're at rest, they're going to stay at rest unless you know you push or pull on them or something, or gravity's acting on them, or there's some kind of static or some kind of electric field, or some force has to be applied to them to make the object change its motion. Then we have Newton's uh, second law, which basically says if I add up all the forces acting on an object, and I have to add them together as vectors, that will be equal to the net force. When I add up all the forces, what's left over is my net force. And my net force is equal to the mass of the object times its acceleration. And this gives us the cause of acceleration. A net force. Of course, how do we define a net force? Well, we define a net force by saying it's something that causes an object to accelerate. So it's kind of a circular argument here, but it does describe nature very, very precisely. This little equation right here, probably the most important equation in all of physics in terms of our everyday life. And then um, the third, this is the law of acceleration. And then uh, law three is the law of interaction. And it basically says um, if you apply a force to an object, there must be an equal and opposite force on another object. When I pound a nail with a hammer, the hammer applies a force to the nail. But the nail applies an equal and opposite force to the hammer. When a bug hits the windshield of a truck, the truck applies a force to the bug. It's rather catastrophic for the bug, right? 
but the bug does apply an equal and opposite force to the truck. Okay, at least it has that, you know, poor little bug. All right, so um, <laughs> these three laws allow us to figure out how objects are going to move based on the forces that are applied to them. And there were certain forces that we described. There's, you know, uh, normal forces. Tension force. You know, force of gravity. Um, force of friction. And then I, um, you know, there's a thrusting force. We haven't really used that. I'm not going to really talk about that. There's um, a generic force. I just call it the, an applied force. This is if somebody's, you know, just pushing on a crate or something like that. Some, some outside agent is pushing or pulling on something, and we just call that an applied force. So using these forces, we can um, use a procedure. Oh, before we get to that, though, there, there are some relationships here. The force of gravity is equal to the mass of an object in kilograms times g. And what is g equal to? Now, 9.8. What units go with g? Now, if the object's in free fall, you can call it meters per second squared, right? Because that's an acceleration. What if the object is not in free fall, like this crate I've drawn right here? Well, I can say that gravity is the strength of, I mean, this is, G is the strength of gravity. It's 9.8 newtons of force for every kilogram of mass. Now, newtons per kilogram reduces to meters per second squared. So a newton per kilogram is equal to a meter per second squared. So these things are equivalent. But this is how I like to think of what G is. And this is the strength of the gravitational field. So we've got F equals MA. We've got force of gravity equals MG. Then we have the force of friction is equal to the coefficient of friction times the normal force. Now what is the normal force? Remember, the normal force is the force between uh, the surfaces of two objects pressed together and, and it's perpendicular to the, that's those surfaces. That's what normal means in mathematics, is perpendicular. So you've got, so you know, on an equation list, what would I have so far? Well, for Friday's test, you need to know these. You need to know this, right? F equals MA. The net force equals mass times acceleration. You need to know the force of gravity is equal to the mass in kilograms times G in newtons per kilogram or meters per second squared. And you need to know that the force of friction is a fraction of the normal force. And uh, this tells you what that fraction is, you know, what percentage. Like if you have a coefficient of friction of 0.8, that's pretty good. That means that the force of friction, of kinetic friction anyway, will be 80% as big as the normal force. So the harder you press the surfaces together, the more friction you're going to get. Then finally, we had the procedure. We can use all of this. Um, to you know, apply it to problems. And the procedure says to do this. Well, the first thing you do is given, find, and solve GFS with a pick. Now, I'm, what I'm doing here is I'm kind of writing down the things I'm going to allow you to put on an equation list. 
you got to do this tomorrow uh, Friday I'm gonna give you four or five problems and you've got to use given find and solve and you've got to draw a picture of the problem with what's given around that picture now by the way in, on the test I will tell you use the procedure on the homework on the uh, take-home test notice the first problem it, it's asking for the net force I think so you don't really need to use the procedure for that. All you need to do is find the acceleration and then multiply that by the mass of the object and you've got the net force. Um, but in most of the problems, you're trying to find like what is the force of friction, what is mu, what is the normal force, what's the acceleration given these other forces. And so you have to use, those are more complicated problems. So you have to use this procedure. Draw the free body diagram. Okay, this shows all the forces acting on an object from outside agents. And all you do is you draw that object. So you redraw the object of interest and only that object and then you show the forces that are being applied to that object. Like, like this little crate right up here that I started with. I wouldn't, to draw a free body diagram of that I would just draw the crate. I wouldn't show the ground. And then I would show, oh, gravity's pulling it down. And then there's a normal force uh, push, you know, pushing up on it. That is the surface of the ground here um, pushing up on it. So there's my free body diagram. So, so step three. Identify your positive x and y directions. Step four, sum the forces in the x equals ma in the x. Sum the forces in the y equals ma in the y. Now when you apply these two ideas, you let, this is telling you how to construct an equation that will let you solve the problem and you look at your free body diagram to let you do that. If this was my free body diagram up over here, I'd say, oh, I don't even need this equation because there are no forces in the x direction. And then forces in the y direction, like this looks a lot like the elevator problem, doesn't it? And so I've got a normal force and a force of gravity, so that tells me add these together and set it equal to ma. Is this accelerating up or down? I don't know. Maybe it's accelerating up, like the grocery bag problem and the take-home test. It's accelerating it up, right? So the normal force is going to be bigger than the weight. And then step five is just solve for your unknown, whatever it happens to be. And if you have these equations, the step four equations constructed properly, if you've drew the free body diagram correctly, and if you know the relationship between friction and normal force and gravity and mass, and you know the kinematic equations so that you can solve for the acceleration, you can solve the problem. Now, the problem is, is that, I mean, what makes this hard is that you have to put this all together to solve problems. Okay, and it is hard, but you know what? Nature is uh, nature's kind of difficult. And uh, it's taken us hundreds of years to figure all this stuff out. So, you know, be patient with yourself and uh, keep working at it. Okay, so now let's, uh, let's move on to the whiteboarding. <laughs>